as our final speaker here. Uh, Mr. Brock retired as Chief Executive Officer of Coca-Cola European Partners in 2016. And prior to that, he was the Chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola Enterprise in Atlanta. You know, that's right across the street. Chief Executive Officer of InBev, a global brewer in Brussels, and Chief Operating Officer of Chadbury Schweppes in London. So if you like to drink, there's the man. Um, but also, as Mr. Brock also previously served as Director of Dow Jones and Company, the Campbell Soup Company, Reed Elsevier. And he's also a trustee and chair of Georgia Tech Foundation, and was previously on Georgia Tech Presidential Advisory Board, and with his wife Mary, co-chaired the Georgia Tech Charitable Campaign, which raised, not the Georgia Tech Campaign, not the Charitable the Campaign, which raised $1.8 billion, if we all remember that. That was a, quite a feat. Uh, Mr. Brock's also the chair of Horizons Atlanta, a philanthropic organization that enhances education for underserved children, a member of the Smithsonian National Board, and a member of the Board of Visitors at the Owen Business School of Vanderbilt University. Uh, he's also a member of the executive board of Mid-Ocean Partners, private equity firm, Bucket Investment Partners, a venture capital firm, and managing director of Brock, Brock Holdings, LLC, an investment company. And Mr. Brock has a BS and MS in chemical engineering and an honorary doctor from Georgia Tech. And so hereby, thank you very much and welcome. And we're here, look forward to hearing. How's that? There we go. Okay, good. Well, uh, thank you for that intro and thank you for giving me the chance to be here to chat a little bit about sustainability. Uh, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart and I always enjoy having the chance to comment on it. Uh, let me first of all say again thanks to Mike for putting this whole session on. Um, I've been here for some pieces of it and it's, uh, it's great to be able to have three days of discussions around a topic so important as sustainability. It's also terrific to be in this building, uh, the Candida building. It's, uh, on, this is only my second time to be in it, but what a show place to have as part of the Georgia Institute of Technology. And it's also great to be able to say Georgia Tech has been on the leading edge uh, of sustainability. You heard Wayne Clough talking about the campus changes, the beautification program that's been underway over the last 50 years. I mean, I think back to my freshman year, which was actually 53 years ago, hard to believe. And as I walked across campus yesterday and looked around, it, it's, it's dramatically totally different. And that's totally not even thinking about jumping the interstate, of course, which was a, a major move. But uh, congratulations again on everything that's happened here at Georgia Tech in the way of sustainability over the last 50 years. Special pleasure, pleasure to have Dr. Cabrera here, uh, Beryl and I were both on the search committee, as were 20 other people, and uh, we, we made what we know is absolutely the right choice, on Hill, and we are so pleased that you are here as the future, as the current leader uh, of Georgia Tech, and the kind of leadership and direction that you're going to bring to this incredible institution, and thank you for being here today. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, I'm very happy for this to be a discussion, so if in, at any point here, uh, I really don't like to think of this as a presentation. If anyone wants to raise a point, challenge something I said, jump right in, I'm happy to do that. You know, one of the questions, and I'm sure you've been probing this, is what is sustainability? And you can look at all kinds of different definitions. You know, one of them is uh, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the need of future generations to meet their needs. But that's not a bad definition. Uh, there's a very specific one, which a lot of people tend to use, which is not being harmful to the environment. And in my view, that's incredibly restrictive and not the right definition. Uh, another one is the capacity to endure and long-term maintenance of well-being. So, you know, you can talk about all of those, but in my book, it is really two things with something significant right hanging over it. And that is, it's all of the things that have to do with the environment, all of the things that have to do with society, and then the economics of how do you achieve those. Economics are obviously super important. I'm gonna talk about three things today. One is, as you see here, what's required, and by the way, this is all, just so you know, this is John Brock's point of view, so highly debatable, but um, you know, having run a, few, a couple of companies, I think it's pretty clear, in my view, what's required for world-class sustainability. Uh, and I'll give you some examples. Then secondly, I'd like to talk about what are the benefits of doing that. And then finally, at the risk of maybe not knowing totally what I'm talking about, a couple of comments about Georgia Tech 
and what we might be able to do. So what is the single most important thing in making sure that an organization is pursuing sustainability in all ways that it should? Leadership at the top. It doesn't matter whether it's the president of the university uh, or the institute or whether it's the CEO of, an, of a company or whether it's the project leader on a team. If you don't have leadership at the top of whatever the entity is that has a personal conviction that sustainability is absolutely essential in everything that's being done, it won't happen. And it doesn't matter how many smart people you have or how much money you're spending. Um, it's a personal journey. And you know, mine started back in 1995 when I was Chief Operating Officer at Cadbury Schweppes in London. I had the fortune of meeting a gentleman named Robert Davis who was trying to get together the CEOs of 20 British companies sponsored by the Prince of Wales. And he formed an organization called International Business Leaders Forum and got each of us to give 10,000 pounds to help begin to figure out what's right. What can we do to make the planet, and it was really focused more on environmental issues at the time, right? And that was my initial journey down this path, which has gone 23 years, around what's required. Uh, when I left uh, Cadbury Schweppes after we joined and went to InBev, then I carried that same view with me. And by then, my personal conviction on sustainability had become much more uh, ingrained in where I was thinking. And then when I came to CCE in 2006, the first day I was here, I realized that the head of communications, who was part of my team, and the head of supply chain, who were part of my team, were personal converts also in the world of sustainability. And the three of us put our heads together and embarked on a journey at Coca-Cola Enterprises, which never stopped. And again, when you've got a team that's engaged and uh, intense, and, and sustainability permeates everything you do and every decision you make, guess what? Good things happen. Uh, and that's important. It has to be part of every decision that's taken. It's a cultural change. Anybody you know, that says you can do it strategically, forget it. Frank Blake, who's the retired CEO at Home Depot, has a terrific phrase he always says, which is culture trumps strategy every day. I know you've heard that, but those words are so right. And again, unless you absolutely change the culture, you'll never get to where you want to be on sustainability. One of the things my team and I concluded after one year, because we did a strategic plan, we looked at where we were and what we wanted to do, and we put out all the stuff about share owner value and the kinds of things we wanted to achieve, the market share we wanted to achieve, but we decided there were three cultural things that were going to be the centerpiece of everything we did and that that could help separate us from other competitors. And those were sustainability, diversity, and technology. And we said, if we can excel at all three of those, everything else will happen. Sure, we've got to manage our customers, we have to manage our stake owners, but those are the things that we're going to focus on to try to be different from our competitors. Communication and collaboration. If you can't communicate the vision that you have, again, whether you're a project leader, head of the School of Chemical Engineering, or a CEO of a company, if you can't communicate the vision that you have in mind for sustainability, the chances of you getting to where you want to be are zero. And it's communicating all the time. It's when you visit a plant in Wakefield, England, which is the second largest soft drink factory in the world, makes 100,000, 100 million cases of Coca-Cola every year. When you walk in the plant, if, if about every third question is about sustainability and what are you doing to reduce energy consumption and what's the situation around landfills, the game changes. It changes dramatically and it really changes among young people, among millennials or whoever it, it is that's at the beginning of the, of the rung because they are so focused on it, it's a beautiful thing and you can capture their hearts and minds. It's really important to have quantitative goals, to spell them out, and to make sure that everybody outside knows what it is you've decided to achieve inside. If you have goals and you're not willing to communicate them, again, it doesn't matter at what kind of an organization or what level, uh, you'll never get to where you want to be. It has to be totally transparent. 
A lot of people would say today you need third-party verification, and I'm a strong believer in that. If you say we're going to reduce the carbon footprint of the beverage in your hand by 50% by 2022, uh, first of all, you've got to know how to calculate the carbon footprint. And you know, when I started on this journey at CCE in 2006, I had no idea what a carbon footprint was. Obviously, today it's center of play. But you've got to have goals, you've got to communicate them, and most of the time, I would say, you don't know how you're going to achieve them. Because in fact, if you do, they're too easy. You need to have goals that in fact, most people would say are not achievable. I think that's, uh, that's really, really important when you start thinking about sustainability. You know, water usage, uh, for example, in our plants. We said we are going to get all of our factories in Coca-Cola to the point where Hopefully, we only use one liter of water for every liter we sell. Now, that's kind of hard because that means you don't waste a drop of water anywhere. If you walk into our plants today, you'll see there are no water rinsers. Everything's air. In fact, you won't see any water anywhere. There's no water on the floor because you keep it clean without water. Um, and it's amazing what you can do when you set, the, set these goals. The, um, you know, the other thing is we said, we are going to replenish water, so obviously we need a liter of water to make a liter of Coke. Uh, that, that's pretty self-evident. And we said for every liter of Coke that we sell in the world, ultimately, we and the Coca-Cola company together are going to replenish that amount of water by looking at the areas of the world where, in fact, water is in such short supply. Final thought here is that, you know, there are a lot of people out there who love to get awards. You know, they do the... Uh, Dow Jones Sustainability Index, which we were members of. We were so happy, actually, the year we achieved it in 2010, we displaced PepsiCo uh, because there can only be 100 uh, on, the, on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, uh, and we, we displaced Pepsi. That was a good thing. But, um, you know, it's, it is about awards, but it's a journey. It's not a destination. Anybody that thinks that you, there's a place, the Nirvana, where you're going to get to and that's it, um, that, that doesn't work. It is a constant journey, and you really, even though you don't know how you're going to get there, you have to constantly be striving. Now, the world has changed a lot, and I thought I'd just show you a couple of photos of articles. Um, and, and if anyone doubts that sustainability is uh, not center of play today, yeah, I'm sure you all know that it is. But uh, the relationship between companies, academic institutions, NGOs, uh, and uh, government has changed dramatically over the last 15 years. I, re I remember back in 2000 when I was at Cadbury Schweppes, we would never remotely think about sitting down with the World Wildlife Fund or Greenpeace. They were enemies. Uh, absolutely. That's just the way we looked at it. And over the intervening seven or eight years, that all changed, and, and companies, NGOs, and governments meet and, and institutions like this one meet regularly to try to figure out a solution. This is an example of McDonald's um, and Starbucks. They are really struggling, and some of you probably have some things going in this area. They're struggling with the plastic linings on the inside of coffee cups because coffee cups are paper and are recyclable, but the plastic that's on the inside makes it a real mess. And so, again, it's a good, good example of how they're trying to work together uh, to solve that problem. Exxon. Exxon is uh, at the forefront of carbon capture. Uh, one of the projects that I know was reviewed here on Monday is Global Thermostat, Chris Jones. Um, I'm actually an investor in that project because I believe in that technology. I don't know who's going to win. I don't know how it's going to all play out. But what I do know is it's really important to try to figure out how to capture carbon. Exxon, again, has been one of our big supporters. Uh, in the world of, of carbon capture, and it's obviously important to them. And it's important from two standpoints. It's important because obviously we've got flue gas going out of coal-fired power plants, but we also have a need for uh, carbon dioxide all over the world for industrial uses, most notably in beverage plants, because we can't make carbonated soft drinks without carbon dioxide. And it is in short supply in certain parts of the world. So, again, economics really drives a good part of what you see going on there. Talking about social, as I said at the beginning, it's environmental, but it's also social. And I think the social side of sustainability is at least as important 
as the environmental side. Unilever has been one of the companies at the forefront of this. We, we patterned a lot of the stuff we did at CCE starting in 2006 after Unilever because again, their CEO had taken kind of a personal conviction. And interestingly, look at all the, the areas on this chart. They're all societal issues. It's human rights, it's responsible sourcing, fair competition, health, safety, diversity, and a focus on making sure that your small business partners uh, are succeeding. Here is one page out of our 2017 CCE Sustainability Report. We started issuing reports every year, 2009, basically saying, look, here's how, here's how we're doing. Here are the things we've publicly said we're going to achieve. Here are the things we did achieve in concert with what we said. And by the way, here are the things we didn't achieve. We thought we could, but we didn't actually get there. And you'll see some very, I know the print may be a little hard to read, but we did some very specific uh, targets that we put out. We said we're going to reduce the sugar in our entire portfolio across all beverages by 10% between 2017 and 2020. That's a staggering reduction when you think about, honestly, how much sugar are in the products that we sell. We said that 100% of our packages will be recyclable by 2025. We have no idea. The Coca-Cola system has no idea how to get there. But I, I think the chances are pretty good we'll figure it out with a lot of help from people like you. We said diversity inclusion. We're going to have 40% of all managerial positions in CCE comprised of women. Again, my, my view is pretty simple. You've got to have objective, quantitative numbers or you'll never get there. We said we're going to reduce water consumption across the board by 20% and that we will have the best, most water efficient plants in the world and we will replenish, as I've already said, 100% of the water uh, that we use. We said we're going to reduce greenhouse gases by 2025 by 50%, and again, still don't know how we're going to achieve that. And then finally, we said 100% of our sources in supply chain will be from sustainable sources. Again, very quantitative goals. We update everybody on how they're going every year and then what our new goals are. And by the way, they obviously get bigger and tougher every year. So we've talked a little bit about what sustainability requires, why do it? And I just have a few thoughts here that I think um, are important and you can put them in whatever order you want. One of the ones that is highly economic is this one. The, the R squared between employee engagement and business performance is extremely high. And in fact, one of the things uh, that we found is that in doing our engagement surveys every other year at CCE, sustainability went from being about number seven or number eight the first year we did the survey back in 2007. The last time we did it when I was there in 2017, it was the number two driver of employee engagement, right behind the vision, mission of the company. So if you're looking for something to energize employees in any organization, the fact that they take pride in that organization because of the approach that organization takes to sustainability, it's critical. <clears throat> Economic. You know, when we started down this road seriously at CCE, I had a couple of board members who came to me and said, John, I got it, okay? You, you want to be on the cutting edge of sustainability. How are we going to afford it? You know, how do we explain to our share owners that you're going to spend, we're going to spend 20 or 40 or 60 million dollars a year? And I said, it's really simple because we've been thinking about this a long time. 90% of the things you do in sustainability pay for themselves. If you reduce energy consumption in a factory because you figured out some way of doing cogeneration, or if re you reduce the amount of plastic, or you increase the amount of plastic that is recycled, or if you save water, all of those pay for themselves. The one thing I would say, and we, we crossed this bridge when we got to it, which is to say about 10% of the projects that are the right things to do for sustainability don't pay for themselves. And you've got to have the conviction as the leader of an organization to simply say, you know what, these are important. And whether it's, uh, again, treating flue gas, or it's a new water treatment system, or whatever it might be, you've got to be willing to pay for some things that don't 
actually pay for themselves. I mean, one of the other things, you know, we, we took a point of view and said uh, that technology development was something else that would occur as we went down this road. And uh, it is incredible. When you put a bunch of smart people in a room uh, or in a room by themselves and you say, look, here's a project that we want to pursue and we can't figure out how to economically do it from a sustainability standpoint, the numbers don't work, remarkable. People work together, they think it through, and they come up with ways that you would never have thought of that can justify economically the project. And again, that's most notably true when you have young engineers from places like Georgia Tech who are so committed to trying to figure out something, and somebody will say, well, we can't, it can't be done, you can't do it. And guess what? A lot of times, they can. The other thing to keep in mind is stakeholders demand it. You know, I remember I just joined 2000, 2006 CCE. I'd been there four months and um, <clears throat> I had a sales said, Walmart has just convened a sustainability conference for their 300 largest suppliers in Bentonville. It's going to be in 30 days and they've demanded that every CEO of their top 300 suppliers are going to show up so they can tell them, us, uh, what their view on sustainability is. Walmart sells 22% of all the Coca-Cola in the United States that sold through that grocery channel. So when someone like that says something, guess what? Everybody listens. And I was there in Bentonville with 299 other CEOs. And Walmart, to their credit, was on the cutting edge and still is uh, of sustainability. And they laid it out very clear. And of course, at that time, nobody had sustainability programs. No one issued sustainability reports. As I said, nobody knew what carbon footprints were. But they demanded it. And in the United Kingdom, Marks and Spencer did the same thing. So it's not just, obviously, customers. Suppliers uh, demand it. We demanded it of our suppliers. You know, we, we would get to the point where we said, you know, historically, you know, you're Ball Corp. You supply us with 80% of our packaging materials. And we've always talked about what's important is quality, service, and price. I mean, it's pretty simple. When you're buying something from somebody, that's what you talk about. We changed the game dramatically and said, you know what, going forward, the first thing we're going to talk about is what are you doing on sustainability? And if you don't play the game the way we want it played, the other three don't matter. That changes the game dramatically. And we have a you know, supplier of the year, sustainable supplier of the year awards. Those were coveted uh, events and awards where we'd invite two or 300 suppliers and give best new sustainable supplier of the year, best large supplier, best small supplier. And it's, again, amazing what you can do when you have a big stick and you put sustainability right at the top of it. And so I talked about customers, suppliers, um, employees. Obviously, it's important. The question I often got asked was, well, OK, what about share owners and what about Wall Street? And I will say, candidly, that's the slowest group coming along. I mean, is anybody really going to buy more stock in CCE because we're on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index? Uh, or we've run the, we, we're part of the FTSE for Good program in the UK? And the answer is not many. But it is changing. And one of the ways it's changing is when every time you have a quarterly earnings report, which we did, and about two thirds of the way through, you say, okay, guys, guess what? We're gonna update you on all the things we're doing on sustainability. At first they got tired, you know, they really were kind of tired and bored, but after a while, they understood it was pivotal to our culture and pivotal to our employee engagement and pivotal to our success. And we did outperform the S&P over the 10 years I was there by about 250%. So we had stakeholders that were very, very happy. And finally, and maybe the most important, is the personal conviction that sustainability is the right thing to do. It's right to do for the planet. It's right to do for people. It's right to do for economics. It is a very simple, I think, personal conviction that needs to be embedded in the organization, but absolutely led from the top. So I'm going to do my third subject here, which is Georgia Tech and what's going on here. 
obviously the person at the top is sitting right over here and I have talked with Angel about sustainability. I know his personal conviction to it and so I'm really pleased again, Angel, that you came here today. But I think just being here is a demonstration of the personal view you have on this subject. And I would encourage all of you, as you think about it, think about how you can lead your organization from a sustainability standpoint, as opposed to thinking about, well, if Georgia Tech would only do this. You know, institutions and companies are breathing, living things, and they have tentacles going in all directions. But the amount of influence that you can have on what's going on is remarkable. So do what we at Georgia Tech do best. And that's all the things you've been talking about for the past three days. I think that's really important. Now the thought is focus, but constantly expand the boundaries. And again, I know some of the programs I've heard you talking about here are doing precisely that. Challenge the status quo. When you think about the advances that have been made in solar, in wind, power over the last decade, and you think about the fact that the United States, and you can like or not like big oil, but the fact is we are exporting oil today. And who would have dreamed that? 15 years ago when we were sucking up oil from all over the world. Uh, remarkable change, and it is all about technology, which is really my third point on what Georgia Tech can do. At the end of the day, technology wins. Capital follows good technical ideas. Capitalism is, it may not be great, but by George, it is the best way to allocate capital to the projects that are important. If you've got a project that makes sense and it's worthwhile, capital will come your way. And so that's what I would say at Georgia Tech is keep in mind, this is a remarkable institution both on the technical side, I think, and on the social side, and we should figure out how to make sure that we are really pushing hard on the technology borders. When I talk to faculty members at Georgia Tech, and I have for a number of years, uh, we have a chair in uh, nanotechnology that we've put in place in the School of Chemical Engineering. I love hearing what people are doing in this university and in this institute. I think, and some of you might want to challenge me on this, but I think one of the things that sets Georgia Tech apart from so many other institutes is the communication and the collaboration that exists across this institute in departments and between departments. Um, I've talked with a lot of people. Mary and I are very involved at Emory. We're very involved in Vanderbilt. Our two older kids went to Vanderbilt, so we, we're involved in all three institutes. I think Georgia Tech is unique. Uh, and as much as I love Emory and the biomedical engineering program that we put in place between these two schools, the fact is, I think communication and collaboration is at the heart of who we are, and I would say, please don't lose it. And the final thing I would say, and maybe the most important thing, is at Georgia Tech, we win. It doesn't matter whether we're you know, raising money or whether we're developing new technology or whether we're thinking about how to, be, how to play our role in the world of sustainability, Georgia Tech is not comprised of losers. We're comprised of winners. Think about that every day because we want to win in the world of sustainability. I know we will. I thank you for the time today. Uh, thank you for being here. It's great to see you. If, I'm happy to take a question or two if anybody wants to, but if people are interested in going, that's equally okay. I'm Rich Simmons with Strategic Energy Institute. Thanks a lot. The 90% uh, that pay for themselves, that's a great angle to look at this. It's also a bit sensitive to the size of a firm or an yeah. institution. So comments on that, how do smaller firms justify that? And the other part of this is, do the 90% pay enough to underwrite the 10%? Well, the answer to the second is no. No, I mean, when you're looking at a project that's putting in um, some sort of a new leaching field, for example, or a new sewage uh, program, there, there are a fair number of projects that are simply not going to pay for themselves, and you've just got to figure out how to do it. Or you've, 
You know, in some cases it's legislated or regulated. Most of the time, though, it's just a tough decision. You've got to go make it and make it work. In terms of small companies, it is a big problem because small companies don't have the resources to go do uh, what needs to be done. And I think there, uh, what you've got to do is pick and choose wisely because, you know, Money is just about as scarce in big companies as it is in small companies. It's just you're dealing with numbers that have a lot more zeros on them. But um, that's, that's all I can say is you've got to be careful and thoughtful. Again, if you're doing a startup company, you know, my son's in the venture capital business in Charlotte and uh, involved with several companies with 8, 10, 12 employees, again, if the person that's the founder and typically the CEO of that small company is committed to trying to figure out how to weave sustainability into the program, it'll happen. It's, it's, it's all the same, no matter what size the company. Yes, sir. Oh, oh over there. Here you go. Yes, thank you for, for the great talk. I'm Jairo Garcia with the uh, School of City and Regional Planning. Um, I was consultant for Coca-Cola in the year 2000, and uh, for 2003 is when they had the, the big problem with water in India, probably you remember that, mm -hmm. and there was a, a syndicate leader killing Colombia, and it was yep. a traumatic change for Coca-Cola. Yep. And uh, they start, I, I started to see the points that you mentioned that was coming from the top, but I saw a lot of a struggle in Coca-Cola with the cultural issue, so my question is, what would you be your, 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 your point like, what would you recommend somebody to address the issue of cultural change that is effective? It's, uh, the question is culture change. You know, honestly, if you're going to change the culture, a good friend of mine, you know, this is before Frank Blake said his thing about culture. Uh, it was, if you want to change the culture, most of the time you're going to have to change the people. I think that's a little overstated. But I mean, if you look back to 1998, one of the worst disasters in the history of the Coca-Cola system was the students getting sick in Belgium and France. At the time, I was at Cadbury Schweppes and on the other side, uh, kind of watching, not, not gleefully, but watching what was going, because obviously it was a very sad situation. But the chief characteristic of the Coca-Cola companies and the Coca-Cola system's response in that situation was not reacting. Uh, it's easy to play hindsight. I mean, you can look at the Tylenol situation, which was before that, and the CEO did a remarkable job of, of doing that. But in that uh, issue, which by the way, the cool light of the morning, there was not an issue, really. Uh, there was a thought that it was pesticides on the uh, pallets of Coca-Cola that was stored in warehouses in Belgium and France, and within a week, all of the Coke in Belgium and France was off the store shelves. Now you talk about a mega problem from a business standpoint, but I think uh, if you ask the people at Coke today, they would say it was lack of responsiveness and a major wake-up call that when something bad happens, that the management of the company, if they accept it, has to be right at the forefront, has to be in front of speakers, in front of microphones and dealing with it. And of course today it's even more so by far because the game, I didn't talk about technology because this was sustainability, but uh, there is no privacy today and there is no time to think. So at least in 1998, the Coca-Cola company, Coca-Cola system, you know, had a day or two or three. Today you have about 13 nanoseconds you know, when somebody uh, puts on Twitter, I just read the r most recent New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, I know that aspartame causes birth defects. Now, that's actually untrue. But if somebody posts that and it goes viral, it's, you know, instantaneous all over the world, and we have to have systems to, to combat that. But to your question, culture comes from the top, and it comes from the, having a team right under the senior leader who is equally committed, and then it just has to permeate everything you do. If it doesn't, you're going to have some problems, and when a problem, a crisis occurs, uh, it's not going to be a pretty picture. Okay, yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Valerie Thomas, um, the Anderson Interface Professor of sure. Natural Systems here. Um, so By the okay. way, he was a visionary. Yes. I, yeah, um, unbelievable. So. It's actually something I'd like you to say uh, a bit more about being a visionary. There are, as you know, quite a few large companies that are taking major action in sustainability, Coca-Cola being one of them. 
Uh, some people say, you know, this is greenwashing, it's some kind of a public relations thing, you know, it's on the side, they must be profiting from this. And there's the other point of view, which many of the CEOs say, and you said, that it is the personal conviction of the leader who really wants to take the company this way. So since that's how you presented it, could you just say a little more about uh, kind of the role of the leader and personal conviction and leadership at the top and sustainability? Uh, yeah, by the way, Ray Anderson, um, I knew, and uh, I unfortunately didn't know him that long, but I did meet him, and the legacy he left at Interface uh, is, is just incredible. He was a pioneer. He was a lot like the person, Bob Davis, that I met in 1996, 95, who kind of began my journey on sustainability. And, um, and Ray, the legacy he left was just amazing, and it permeated everything they did. And you step back and say, a carpet company, a, co a company that's manufacturing floor coverings is going to be the leader in sustainability in the whole southeastern part of the United States, maybe the whole country. A little unusual, but, but he had that personal conviction. And that's what I think it comes down to. If, if uh, you know, I didn't have it that strong, I'll admit, when in, in 2006, I met him. We had a sustainability conference actually at the Georgia Tech Hotel and Conference Center, which has only been open three, three years. And we brought in a bunch of people. And it was that assimilation, I think, that took place for me over a couple of years. I, I don't think the personal conviction on sustainability happens like this. It's a little bit of a, an evolutionary process. And at some point, if you're a leader who really believes in it, you sort of have the faith and you say, we're going to go and we're never going to relent and it's going to be part and parcel of everything we do. I mean, one good example, and again, I think putting actions in, into place more than words is important. Uh, one of the first things we did in 2007 after we had this sustainability summit at CCE is we decided to form a sustainability committee for a board committee for uh, CCE. Even today, if you look at the Fortune 500 companies, there are only 22% of them that have a sustainability committee. I think that's a major shortcoming. I think having a board committee, you know, typically companies only have five, four, five, six committees, having one of them that is totally focused on sustainability is a good indication of what the CEO and the board of that company think about it. So I think you need to look for visible signs and signals. Obviously, getting awards is a good thing. You know, not only just the Dow Jones, but get, there are lots of awards out there that you can compete for. And if you're competing for them and winning them, and then you send that message throughout your organization, you know, it's, it's incredible. Okay, I probably ought to finish up on that note. Angel, thank you for coming. We'll see you later. Okay. Michael, anything else? Just wanted to thank you for those uh, uh, inspiring words and uh, uh, vision. And um, this actually concludes our sustainability showcase. And uh, thank you very much for coming. And uh, we'll do it again one day. Congratulations. <laughs>